Great. Well, for our next talk, we have a double act. Um, Maya Kita Tegmark works in psychology at Boston University, and Max Tegmark works in physics and cosmology at MIT. They both have extremely broad interests, but you know, one of the subjects around which their interests converge is this uh, topic of the future of artificial intelligence. They've both been central in the Future of Life Institute, which has just been uh, founded over the last couple of years and has already become a really major force in the field. Today, they're going to talk about what we should want, physics and psychology perspectives. So please welcome May and Max. It's a pleasure and an honor for us both to be here. And uh, we were encouraged by David, those of us who, f f who work in fields other than AI, to step forward and see what we can bring to the table to help with all these fascinating questions that are being discussed here. So from that, we are going to bring perspectives from physics and from psychology, but of course, you know, in the good tradition of psychotherapy, I will not give you any useful answers to our very ambitious title here. I will just ask you, how do you feel about this? So back to physics. What can physics do for you? you know, we can give you tools that can help understand some of the interesting questions that we're discussing here, like what are the ultimate limits on computation? on intelligence, the ultimate limits on the future of life, uh, the options we have for ultimate goals that we just heard about from Stuart and from Eliezer here. Um, for psychology, um, we can offer you tools for understanding human well-being, for debugging your minds and your thinking, and hopefully for, for designing or at least inspiring um, psychomorphic AI systems. And I use the word psychomorphic here as a parallel to neuromorphic. I mean actually constructing psychological features in artificial systems, not just projecting them onto artificial systems. Now, often when I hear my AI friends discuss what we should want, <clears throat> what sort of future we want in, on the timescale of centuries or millennia, they get scoffed on by other, uh, by other people and say, oh, that's science fiction to talk about such distant horizons like a hundred years or a thousand years. As a cosmologist, <laughs> I find this just hilarious, you know, because for us, talking about a billion years into the future isn't science fiction, it's science. It's the mainstream we do all the time. We have a very good idea of what happened in the last 13.8 billion years, and I can tell you with great confidence a lot about what's going to happen in the next billion that sort of frames this. I can tell you as a physicist, for example, that if we don't improve our technology, we're, we, the question isn't if we're going to go extinct. The question is just, are we going to get taken out first by a super volcano or an asteroid impact, or are we going to get taken out by the sun, eventually evaporating all our oceans in a billion years. So the th if you take a physics perspective, you really learn to love technology. And the good news is that with technology, if you, I can tell you about in the Q&A, how we can solve all of these problems and really help life flourish for billions of years if we don't wipe ourselves out first. So physics has a very optimist, optimistic message to bring to this conference, which is, first of all, yeah, technology can very much be our friend, and we also have just vastly greater potential for the future of life than we thought we had. We don't just have hundreds of years left to go, but billions, and not just here on Earth, but also throughout the cosmos. We have, over a hun we have hundreds of billions of solar systems in our galaxy, hundreds of billions of other galaxies, amazing things we can do, great resources and opportunities, and physics can also give a great deal of optimism about the future of intelligence because I know as a physicist that this brain is simply a quark blob arranged in such a way that it processes information in certain sophisticated ways and there is absolutely nothing in the laws of physics that you're saying you can't make quark blobs that are much smarter than this quark blob and if you, in case you're worried that Moore's law is about to fizzle out because you read that in a British tabloid or whatever <laughs> physics has good news here too the, we have actually this nice work by Seth Lloyd showing what the ultimate limits from physics are on computation, and we are 33 orders of magnitude away from that. So we can do a lot better than we can do. Yet another source of optimism is don't feel insignificant, all right? We've, during the first 13.8 billion years of life, viewed life as just a minor perturbation on an otherwise lifeless cosmos, right? But 
if you look at this planet, it's clear that life is having a more and more dramatic impact of what Manhattan looks like, right? Even though uh, in the cosmic scale, so far, we're still just a perturbation. What physics tells us is that if intelligence keeps developing, it's, it's very likely that our entire cosmos will also transform where life goes from just being a little minor perturbation to really a dominating driving force. So a lot of uh, great opportunities here. The bad news is that physics cannot tell us which of these opportunities we should actually want. What's actually gonna make us happy and make us feel well-being in the future. So for that, we instead need to turn back to psychology. So um, us psychologists, we're much cooler. We have a very <laughs> clear answer to what you should want, unlike physicists. And what you should want, you should want happiness and you should want well-being. If, if you don't desire well-being for yourself or for your fellow human beings, see me after the talk for a diagnosis. <laughs> so I was very uh, fortunate to be here um, at another, for another conference on the future of AI, organized by Jan LeCun. And one of my thinker heroes, who's right here, Daniel Kahneman, asked a very important question, namely, will AI make you happy? And I was very surprised to see uh, how difficult it was for people to engage with this question. So if we turn to psychology and try to understand a little bit about what well-being is for, human, for humans is supposed to be, uh, we have different psychological theories. This is one of them. This is one of the more popular one, ones. And um, if we look at this theory, for example, human well-being has three components. Um, you should leave a, lead a pleasant life, a life of enjoyment. You should lead a good life, a life of engagement, and a meaningful life, um, feeling affiliation to your fellow human beings. You feel meaning and purpose and also accomplishments. Now, it's easy to speculate how AI can impact all of these in the future, but we can do better, actually. We can um, not just speculate, but actually test some, uh, some hypotheses that we have in psychology. So, for example, if we look at the good life, at the life of engagement, um, and take it as a case study for how AI might impact it, one worry that is um, talked about a lot is how automation might might impact the good life, the life of engagement where you, you feel you know, your own self-efficiency in the world. So what does psychology have to say about this? Um, let's see what psychology has to say about um, the possible perturbation of the job market, so job loss. Psychology says that unemployment can produce negative long-term effects on well-being. Even re-employment can produce negative effects on well-being, and that not even considering the fact that you need to switch to a different field, to a different kind of job. Even retirement has mixed effects on well-being, both positive and negative. But I, you, know, you can argue, well, does this really say anything about AI or more, more about the way we have our societies constructed? So let's look a little bit about what matters. So if we try to ask psychologists what do, they, what do they find about what really matters, what drives this well-being, we see that financial satisfaction is one of the strongest predictors of life evaluation, respect being a strongest predictor of positive feeling. So if we could, in a way, make sure that the financial needs of people are being satisfied, for example, by having some basic income and that they can be engaged in some um, activities that gain them the respect of other people, then maybe we can, we can actually reap the benefits of having AI that will probably make our jobs much more interesting um, and will eliminate all the drudgery and, and tasks that can be easily automated. We can go even more in depth. There are lots of other groups to study. Um, we can study part-time workers. Maybe we should just simply work less. We can uh, study homemakers. Maybe we should just focus on our relationships, raising our kids instead of work. Um, we can focus on people who retire early and so on and try to get useful insights on how, um, how, uh, how we should design a society that's very welcoming of AI and uses it for good. Um, we can also study different constructs, psychological constructs, such as self-efficiency, drudgery, play, and so on, to gain all these important information for how to make AI most beneficial for us. So we just heard about various ways in which AI can make us more happy or, or less happy, and create a better future or worse future, and there's a fascinating uh, spectrum of opinions about what will actually happen if we get AI much better, particularly to the, to the human level. It's a particular honor for me to show this plot, which I partly plagiarized from waitbutwhy.com, since we have the creator of 
<laughs> but why not come here in, in the audience? And uh, <clears throat> this is not the only axis, though, where there's a fascinating disagreement. Pessimism versus optimism. There is also a very interesting disagreement about the timeline of things. Will we get human-level AI within a century or so, or is that very, very unlikely? Both of these, I think most of the very serious researchers and thinkers I know fall into these three categories in the upper right here. <clears throat> and I respect all three of these viewpoints. I, any of them might be right. This is a very, very legitimate topic that we should discuss more. And uh, in addition to that, we should also discuss a lot more, of, of course, all the fascinating technical challenges that come with any of those three views, such as what we heard about from Stuart Russell and Eliezer this morning, for example. So to f really be able to focus on these legitimate questions, it's very important that we don't get distracted by illegitimate questions, silly <coughs> myths and confusions, such as what Stuart Russell brought up this, this morning. Since he didn't have time to talk about all of them, let me see if I can just put them, my top seven ones or so on together on just one page here. First, there's this, this myth that we know for sure the timeline. Whereas if you actually go ask the expert, this is a poll we did at the Puerto Rico meeting last year, the conclusion is obvious. We simply don't know when we're gonna get human level AI. There are a lot of very smart researchers who think it's never gonna happen or take hundreds of years. There are also a lot of really smart ones who think maybe we'll get there in decades. So the conclusion is obvious. Um, just um, start preparing now in case this happens so we can make the best of it. Another very persistent myth is that the only people who worry about these things are Luddites. Well, I have news for you. Stuart Russell and all the other AI experts in this room who do worry about these things are not Luddites. Another per persistent myth has to do with what it is that the worriers worry about. Uh, it's simply not the case that what Stuart Russell and others are really worried about is that AI is gonna turn evil or, or turn conscious. The concern is simply not malice, but competence. If we have, uh, if I'm, for example, <coughs> in charge of uh, this awesome green energy project which is gonna create a hydroelectric plant, power plant, and it's gonna be great. And there's a little ant hill in the middle. You know, I actually like ants. I go out of my way on the sidewalk outside here if I see one to not step on it. But in this case, you know, tough luck for the ants. It's not that I'm an evil ant hater. It's just that my goals weren't quite aligned with the ants, and I'm gonna turn on the water. And we just wanna make sure we don't place humanity in the, in the position of those ants. <laughs> That's what the concern is. Uh, another persistent myth is that the thing we should worry about is robots. And uh, the truth, of course, is that the concern is not robots. It's simply the intelligence. If you have some very su superior intelligence, it doesn't need a robot to have a lot of impact. It just needs an internet connection. Yet another myth is that somehow machines can't control humans. Well, the reason we can control ti tigers isn't because we have sharper claws or s stronger muscles. It's just because we're smarter than them. Right? Yet another myth is that machines cannot have goals. Now. What I mean by goals, the thing we're concerned about isn't some sort of touchy-feely definition of goals. We're just concerned about exhibiting goal-oriented behavior, and that machines can absolutely do. You know, If you're chased by a heat-seeking missile, you're probably not gonna say to yourself, I'm not worried about this, because that missile doesn't have goals. And just to elaborate on this a little bit more, Stuart Russell brought up this very important point, of, and so did Eliezer, about emergent goals. Pretty much whatever, goal you actually have initially, which could be as, sim as silly as just maximizing your score in this little computer game I made up here where you're trying to just save the sheep and bring them in from the bad, bad wolf and get it into the air, safe area here, will give you certain other sub-goals. First of all, you realize pretty quickly it would be that you don't want to go through here and blow up because if you're a dead robot, you're not going to get any more points and save no more sheep. So you get self-preservation instinct pretty much whatever your goal is. Again, Steve Mohandro is the first person to have brought this up. You also get a goal of uh, <coughs> improving your world model because if you when you start learning more about your world, you realize there's a shortcut here, which is great. You also tend to get an emergent goal of getting more resources. Like why not get this little potion here that lets you run twice as fast? Or why not pick up this gun here so you can shoot the wolf and save all the sheep? You know? So the bottom line is pretty much whatever goal you start with, if it's really ambitious, it will give you the sub goal of keeping those goals, enhancing your capabilities, 
get better hardware, software, preserve yourself, get curious, lots of other things, okay? <coughs> Which may, if we haven't thought this through carefully, clash with our human goals and give, give goal, goal misalignment. Finally, we have the myth that people who worry about this <coughs> all worry because they're persuaded that superintelligence is just, it's gonna happen next week, and that what we should all do right now is panic. When, of course, the fact is that all people <coughs> who are concerned about this are saying is, well, if there's a non-negligible ch negligible chance it might happen in this century, hey, now would be a pretty good time you know, to start planning ahead and, and preparing, okay? Now, these are a bunch of myths that we've identified and kind of understood, but it's important to ask all, not just about them, but why did we make these lo lo logical mistakes? What bugs in our thinking led to these myths? Because if we can understand that, that can help us also understand other bugs in our thinking we haven't yet identified in the context of a future AI. So with that, let's turn over to our debugger, psychology. So uh, psychology doesn't just offer us ways of, of testing hypotheses about our own well-being, but um, that we can you know, try to uh, apply both in the near-term future, for example, as I give the example of, of job markets, but also in the longer-term future when we deal with this unease of, of being outsmarted by other entities. But it can also give us some tools for, for debugging our own thinking. And Max likes to say this a lot, that in order to create a good future, we need to win the race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we manage it. So I feel that psychology has something to say about wisdom. Um, and this agrees with the uh, gr old Greek advice, know thyself, uh, mainly be aware of your own cognitive biases. And Daniel Kahneman has done amazing research trying to map out all these cognitive biases. If we go back to the belief, common, commonly held beliefs about AI that Max has explored, for example, this idea that it might be inevitable or impossible, here is a cognitive bias for you to consider. Maybe you are just having a confirmation bias. You are searching, interpreting, favoring, and remembering information in a way that already confirms your, your own pre-existing belief. Um, another commonly held belief, uh, especially in the general public, is that robots are the main concern. Maybe people should worry a little bit about the availability bias, and namely that you're overestimated the overestimating the likelihood of events happening, maybe because of all those Hollywood blockbusters that you've seen, or simply because of the cognitive strain that you know, it takes to, under to really imagine a disembodied intelligence. So uh, coming back here to the question of what we should want and ultimate goals and so on, yet another thing that physics brings to the table is a little word of caution that more work is needed here. We heard particularly Eli Eliezer talk here about how things get harder when you start thinking really long-term about open-ended goals, because most AI problems are not like that. Traditionally, it's like, okay, goal, win this chess game. Goal, drive this self-driving car from A to B safely. Okay, we know how to handle that. But a lot of famous papers, and even Nick Bostrom's book, talks about the idea of final goals something much more long-term, the ultimate goal of the machine of the, of the, that a super-intelligent AI might have. And here, as a physicist, big warning flags go off. You know, what do we mean by the final goal for our universe? Do we mean that we have a function that specifies exactly the best way to arrange all our particles? That's the goal? Okay, suppose the, we managed to accomplish that. Now what? You know, time doesn't end, <laughs> at least not last time I is doing physics research, there's no indication of that. So, so there's, things are gonna keep happening. The whole question of final goals really deserves a lot more research to make sure we're not just chasing after a mirage here. And um, moreover, we know a few things about the ultimate fate of our cosmos, we think. Entropy keeps increasing and it seems like ultimately whatever we do, there'll be some kind of cosmic heat death, which will be kind of a bummer. So. I think the real key message here from physics is really, it's not the destination, it's the journey. So um, going back to the journey and to see what psychology has to say about this journey and how to make it happy, 
Um, we've heard yesterday a very beautifully articulated vision for the future of human and, I, uh, and AI collaboration um, that was expressed by Francesca Rossi. So I think that you know, if we envision and if we work towards a future uh, where AI systems will be our um, companions, our collaborators, maybe, me, maybe even our descendants, then something that we will probably want is to put in them cognitions and behaviors that we are most proud of. And the good news from psychology um, is that so, for example, one, one very good, one very good um, cognitive and behavioral mechanism is, is altruism, right? We might want to have that in our companion robots, in our collaborator AI systems. Um, so the good news from psychology is that altruists exist, uh, and even extreme altruists exist, and not just as an idea in our heads, but actually in actual real people. Um, and this is an existence proof that there is, th it is possible to have intelligent entities that are even more altruistic than most people. And we'll hear from the next speaker how, you know, super intelligent might be even construed as super ethical. And the even better news is that uh, psychology is now making a lot of progress trying to understand really the cognitive mechanisms behind extreme altruism. And I won't go into details now in the interest of time, but I, I'd be happy to get questions about this, this amazing paper that came out two years ago. So um, to wrap this things up, I hope that Max and I have convinced you that there are some very useful tools, both from physics and from psychology, in terms of considering what we want. And um, I hope we all use them when we meet with the proverbial genie so that you know, we ask for the right things and don't have to put them back in the bottle. So thank you very much. Hi, uh, my question is, how can we prevent religion mingling too much into AI? So in the future, we don't have AI who probably hates people who masturbate or uh, hates uh, people who are homosexual, for example. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a, a very interesting question, which I think is part of the broader question about when we say we want to make sure that the, the future AI is aligned with our values, Whose values? Are we talking about my values, ISIS's values, some do random dude uh, in the Middle Ages as values? You know. So I think the me the real message here is first of all, of course, this, this is a very f important open question, and second, this shows that to really make the best of AI, it's not enough to just have technical research among AI scientists, right? We all we really need to get psychologists, sociologists, philosophers. And also, to, uh, and really, the whole human community looking into these questions because this is an answer that everybody has to come together and really pursue. Um, so, just a, a, a quick thought from the point of view of psychology. So, if we look at psychopathology, for example, and and when we define psychopathology, we really define it. Um, it boils down not to values. It actually boils down to how well you are able to cooperate in, in, in a human society. Um, so I think that one thing that we might want to make sure that the AI systems that we create have is, is this ability to really cooperate well with us. Now, you know, human beings have not been so good at cooperating with other species, so actually we don't know what, what is going to happen, but that's one goal and one vision that we, we should have. And just very briefly, one other very interesting point which Francesca Rossi mentioned yesterday is that in the short term, even be long before we've figured out what we ultimately want, it makes a lot of sense to put in at least some kindergarten ethics that we can all agree on into the systems we build. Like airplanes should never under any circumstances, if they have any kind of AI in them, fly into a building or fly into a mountain like when Andreas Lubitz, the German wings pilot, told us to do that, right? <coughs> Already putting in some basic uh, minimal ethics into machines is going to be a big step up from wh where we are now. We shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So for Ms. Kita Tegmark, um, insofar as some undesirable behaviors 
might actually be beneficial towards goals. For example, in rationality, sometimes people talk about how maybe you're procrastinating because the thing that you're going to do shouldn't actually be done. Um, maybe you should be focusing on something else, and that's why you end up procrastinating, because you shouldn't be doing the thing. Um, or, in, or just vaguely, if some undesirable behaviors are equilibria in really subtle ways, do you think that, um, in terms of like embedding psychological mechanisms in AI, do you think that it could be problematic to only embed beneficial, obviously beneficial behaviors and psychological mechanisms? So, so that is a very good question. Um, personally, I feel a little bit more pessimistic, um, honestly, about our ability to really create psychomorphic um, AI systems. And the reason for that is that I feel, you know, evolution has had a very, very long time to try all sorts of solutions. And I feel that, you know, in the spirit of what Stephen Wolfram was talking about yesterday, we might actually stumble upon solutions for behaviors, you know, that don't go through the same routes of, of our own cognitions and, and feelings. So I think, you know, it's a, it, they will be inspired by our psychology, and in that in that in that way, you know, they will they will have both some of our that we we would want for them to have some of our beneficial, you know, um, behaviors. But in terms of you know the cognitions and the justifications of those behaviors in the grander you know scheme of of the of the AI psyche, so to talk, um, it's it's hard to imagine what that architecture would be like. I mean, we we don't know yet so much about our own psychology that uh, I think there are huge technical issues even in just specifying how is it that we behave in the way that we behave or have the cognitions that we, we have. But it's, a, it's an interesting question. Like, are we able to create, will we be able to create sort of the ideal um, you know, behavioral and cognitive entity or not? Um. Thanks. Uh, in one of the slides you had a, a rocket uh, and you said that that rocket has a goal. Um, which, uh, I, I mean, it all boils down to definitions, but what kind of, what was the def what would be like a definition of the goal of the rocket? And the real question is, what's the difference between the rocket's goal and a human goal versus an AI goal? I, like, I, have, I guess I have to bring mm -hmm. the word consciousness up, like a yes. conscious goal versus just a physical, material, you know, find the lowest energy state sort of goal. Uh, so uh, wh how do you think that comes about, like this conscious goal versus these? Just Great. atomic goals. Excellent questions. So let me answer that. When, if we, ca if we care about how the machines feel and if we're being cruel to them and uh, whether there's mind crime like Nick Bostrom said and so on, then we care a lot about consciousness and, and all the subjective issues. But if we, c for, for if we care about us, what's going to happen to us, it simply doesn't matter at all whether the machine has a subjective experience in the spirit of David Chalmers' hard problem it just matters what it does, okay? So if you look at the behavior of machines, then we can make a very clear definition of what we mean by it having goals. We can ask, is the behavior of the machine best explained caused through causality, that this caused this, caused this, or is it more economically explained teleologically? So saying this heat-seeking missile is simply acting as if it's trying to hit my airplane. And we have a lot of examples where machines are most economically described like the latter. And whenever that happens, I think it's reasonable to say they're showing goal-oriented behavior. That's what I mean by having goals. And uh, if a machine has as its goal, in that sense, you know, to do something that we don't want it to do, that's a problem. So I think the message is very clear in the sense that matters, that, we, that could cause us to have concern. Yes, machines can have goals. What Max is trying to do is he's trying to encourage you to be a, a hardcore behaviorist, basically, when you think about AI. <laughs> but, I, 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 and you and David Chalmers can t testify to this, I think the question of consciousness is absolutely fascinating, and I'm spending a lot of my research, actually, and I might be studying it. But that does not change the fact that completely aside from that, machines can exhibit goal-oriented behavior, and we want to make sure it's, that behavior is what we want. Okay, we're, we're basically going to power on through. There's not, a, uh, there's not a coffee break, but while Wendell sets up, feel free to take a, you know, take a minute or so to stretch in place um, as a little mini break. We figure if people start leaving this place, we'll never get them back in. So.